So hello everyone and welcome. Um, my name is Rebecca Hausberger from GIZ, the Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit or Cooperation for International Cooperation. And today we're hosting a session on how can we secure small scale farmers against climate risk. This is going to be a workshop, so we're hoping for lots of interaction from you and everyone. And uh, we have two speakers with us, one being Emily Coleman from IFAD and the other one being Peter Hazel from IFPRI. Well, we'll give more details later on. Unfortunately, I'm not um, able to share my camera while I share the presentation, but we can, um, I encourage you all to put on your camera to keep this as interactive as possible also as we're um, yeah, trying to get your comments and reactions in real time. All right. So first to start off some housekeeping, um, of course, um, as I said, I wanted to keep this interactive, but please mute yourself during the presentation. There will be a QA and a at the end and also an interactive part. So if you want to ask a question, feel free to post it in the chat and we will address it at the end. Or also if you wanna ask it verbally, feel free to unmute yourself at the end. And to start us all off and to get like a feel of uh, who is with us today, I wanted to do a quick poll. So it should come up in your chat quite soon. And the first question being, what is your motivation to join us today? Do you want to learn more about the topic of agricultural insurance? Or do you want to be inspired on the topic overall? Or if you're working on the field of international cooperation, do you want to get new ideas for new projects? Um, I can't see it yet, but this poll should come up in a second. And feel free to choose more than one answer. So if you want to do all three of those, if you want to learn more, be inspired and get new ideas, then feel free to click on all three. So the poll is up now. Um, if you click on polls, or it should just pop up, and you can click on what you want to answer. Great, okay, uh, very interesting. I can see that most of you want to learn more about the topic, which is great because we're gonna talk more about it. Um, also, some of you wanna be inspired and some of you wanna get new ideas for new projects. Um, so this brings me to the second question, which is, there are 500 million smallholder farming households in the world. How many agricultural insurance policies do you think are being sold every year to them? And here you can choose only one answer because only one is the correct one. So is it either 400 million, 189 million, 265 million or 250 million? And I can see this poll is up now already as well. So if you want to answer, feel free. All right. Okay. I can see like the preliminary results. Um, most of you think it's 189 million. Um, that's interesting because we did a similar poll a couple of weeks ago and we got the same result. Um, it's actually 265 million. So almost or more than half um, of all the farmers have some kind of insurance and protection against agricultural risks. Um, so that's interesting to know, um, but for, to, for you to know what we're going to talk about today, um, I will give you a quick overview of our agenda. So um, first we will talk about how to support smallholder farmers with agricultural insurance. Of course, for that we first have to establish what is agricultural risk. 
Then we will talk about a study that GIZ has been uh, finalizing, which is on the current state of agricultural insurance and where Peter and Emily were both involved. And finally, we will have some form of interactive discussion and also, of course, including that as a Q&A. And if you have questions before that, feel free to post them in the chat at any time. And I would ask everyone to mute yourselves during the presentation if possible. Thanks. All right, so as you saw, it's not only me today as a speaker, but we have uh, two panelists here with us. The first being Emily Coleman. And Emily is an agricultural insurance technical lead for the CEDA Finance Insured Program, overseen by the multi-donor platform for agricultural risk management and hosted at EFAD. She has over 14 years of experience in international development at several UN institutions and experience in project management, implementation, research and development, capacity building and technical assistance. Her regional experience spans from Africa to Asia and includes Cambodia, China, Rwanda, Senegal and Zambia. And she co-authored many international publications on agricultural insurance. And she was a technical reviewer for our study that we will talk about more later on. And our second panelist is Peter Hazel. He's a research fellow emeritus at the International Food Policy Research Institute, and he works as an independent researcher from his current base in California. Um, during his career, he held very various research and management positions at the World Bank and IFPRI, as well as academic appointments at the University of Newcastle upon Thine and Imperial College London in the UK. And his work focuses on research and advisory work on policy issues related to agricultural development. And some of his most prominent publications include works on risk management and agricultural finance, farm and agricultural sector modeling, the impact of technological change in agriculture on the poor, and returns to public investments in agriculture, etc. And his regional experience is in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and Central Asia. I think there's a word missing. And also, he was, of course, the co-author of our study that we will talk about more later on. All right, so before we talk about our study, I wanted to first give you a brief overview of how we understand agricultural risks or what are the risks a farmer actually faces. So as you can see in this chain, which is more or less the value chain of uh, agricultural products, the farmer is kind of in the middle and farmer faces a host of different risks. So one for, of course, is the market risk. So fluctuating prices of inputs, but also of his produce and crops. The other one, and this is a big one, being production risk. So that means that, for example, adverse weather events, pests or diseases, or even labor and health risk can put his um, outcome risks and might lead to less um, yield at the end of the cropping season. And of course, these farmers who are highly dependent on their crops do manage these risks quite well and have several tactics they use to uh, minimize the risks themselves. So one being good agricultural practices, um, this is also highly uh, propositioned by GIZ and several projects. So that's something we try to spread across all our projects. Also smart crop selection can make a high difference um, if the crop is well suited to the regional arrangements around it, then that's uh, less risk for the farmer. And good infrastructure also always is very important. Um, finally, one um, management tactic can also be the diversification of activities. So not only being a farmer, but maybe having a side job as another job like a driver or welder, etc. But still, in despite all of these management tactics, there's still some residual financial risk at the end of the day for the farmer. Um, and usually what, what, what does a farmer do to minimize their risks? One being risk retention. So this could mean saving, like building a reserve in case of uh, disaster strikes or other informal practices like saving circles within the community or uh, um, borrowing from relatives, etc. And also into play comes risk finance. This means on the one side credit, this could be formal or informal and usually happens after disaster strikes. So if there is no crops, 
then the farmer usually needs quick money and this is where they borrow credit. Or, and this is where it becomes interesting for us, insurance. So insurance is usually before taken out before a disaster or extreme weather event. And in case uh, the payouts are triggered, this usually leads to quick payouts and quick money in the hands of the farmer, which they need to then rebuild or just smooth over consumption in the short term. And this is also where we come into play when we're looking at agricultural insurance. Um, and in agricultural insurance, we usually look at three different kinds. Uh, one being indemnity based, where payments are based on actual losses. And here we can see that the administration costs are quite high because what usually happens is that assessors come to uh, the farmer, have a look at the losses and then uh, make an assessment of how high the payout should be. Um, and of course, this is, like I said, high admin costs, but this also leads us to a low risk of there being a misalignment of the actual damage and the payout because it's been quite thoroughly assessed. In the middle here, you can see the area yield-based index or insurance, where payments are based on area yield estimates like crop cuts. And this has medium administration costs because there's still more staff involved, but not as much because there's also technology like the index. But also this index leads to a slightly higher basis risk because the index is always just as good as the data. And if the data isn't right, then there might be a misalignment between the loss and what is actually being paid out. And finally, we have the weather index based insurance where payments are linked to an index, which can be, for example, based on rainfall, like if there's too little or there's too much. Um, and if these thresholds are being triggered, then payments are made automatically. And because this happens automatically, the administration costs are usually quite low, but also the basis risk is more high because, as I said, these indices are only just as good as the data that we put in. All right, so that's it for a quick overview on the different insurance kinds that we have been looking at. On to our study. This study will be uh, published in the next couple of weeks and is concerned about the current state of agricultural insurance. In the case of our um, study, we were only looking at insurance for smallholder farmers, as this is our target group mainly. And to collect data, um, we did 15 interviews with three insurers, insurers, brokers, insurtechs, partners and experts in the course of one year, so in 2020. Um, and we collected data from more than 50 agricultural insurance schemes. And with these data points, did a comparison of more than 10 different variables and data subsets, um, where, which you can also find then in the study in more detail, but we will also show you um, now. And we also had a second section on innovations and new trends, and we did a systematic analysis of those as well. And some of our key findings uh, from the study included that about half of all farms in the low middle income countries have at least some form of agricultural insurance. And that's also something that came out in the polls just there. Like I said, 265 million farming households. We also saw that insurance coverage is still limited and does not account for the complete damage. Okay. So this means that even though a household is insured, usually when an extreme weather event happens, this could mean that even though the insurance, for example, covers drought, if there is a flood, then it does not account for those damages. What uh, we also found was that the global distribution of insurance coverage is very unequal. Um, and this is mainly due to China and India, where 95 of the farms are uh, where our numbers came from. For example, only China alone is almost at 200 million insured households. And comparing that to 265 million overall explains uh, the high difference. In terms of numbers, most agricultural insurance is offered by private insurers in our sample, but we also often saw that there is a high, high subsidy rate among those programs that we looked at. So usually it looks like a private insurer coupled with some government support is the recipe for success. And we also found comparing private sector to public sector that the private sector programs are quite smaller on average and usually also a lot younger. 
which makes sense because there's not as much money behind them. Continuing the key findings, we found that index insurance is the most common type of agricultural insurance. Here I have to add that this might be due to a slight bias in our sample because we've been building the sample on our 2016 study, which also was concerned about the current state of agricultural insurance, but this time only on index insurance. So there might be more than index insurance in our sample than there might be in the market. But we also found that more than half of agricultural insurance programs are internationally reinsured, which we took as a very good sign that the market is well connected and that risk is being shared and diversified. So making more programs more sustainable. Um, having a closer look at some of the programs in our sample, we found that they cover a variety of risks, but most often drought and flood also because these are the most common risks that farmers face. And so the products are the most well thought, sought after. The median age of our surveyed programs is six years and they were ranging from zero to 17 years. However, there are some government programs who have been running longer, but under different names. So we only took into account here the latest version of the current program. And finally, most agricultural insurance programs, which account to about 80%, are at least partially subsidized. So this also um, means that subsidies are usually very, very important when it comes to the design of a long-lasting insurance scheme. Apart from the numbers, um, as I mentioned, we also did an analysis on trends and innovations and had a look at how could the future look like for agricultural insurance. And we found that one trend that we made out was that the integration of insurance into agricultural value chains or into agricultural finance looks like a recipe for success. Because the more convenient insurance is for the farmer to buy, the more likely they are to actually purchase it. And this, of course, means financially, but also just like in the process of buying it. And here, uh, this could mean, for example, bundling insurance while buying seeds or also including insurance in an off-taker uh, um, scheme, whatever fits and makes insurance not an extra step to buy in the process. And uh, as an innovation, we identified advances in remote sensing and crop modeling as being very important. Um, this is coming from the technological side. So, uh, the easier it gets to, to analyze damages done, the lower the cost, the cheaper the uh, insurance can be offered and the more attractive it becomes as a product. And also on the digital technology side, we found that smart apps, electronic banking and blockchain and other innovations in that sphere look like they could really change the market with the spread of smartphones, especially apps are becoming more relevant in, uh, around the world. As an example here, you can see this picture of iFarm, which is a cooperation between GIZ in Sri Lanka and a local insurer. Um, and this is an app where farmers can purchase insurance. They can also make claims. They can receive payouts through the app. And there's also some value added services like um, displaying the market prices around them or giving some information on the local weather. So after doing our analysis on the numbers and also having a look at all the trends and innovation, what are our recommendations? So we found that it's imperative for a successful insurance market to have a strong legal and regulatory environment that mean allows private schemes or private companies also to develop new pilots, to develop innovative projects and products and to keep up with all the challenges and demands, for example, from climate change. Um, we would also encourage everyone to rethink the relationship of agricultural risk finance, disaster assistance and social protection. So do not see insurance as a one standalone project, product, but see it in like the sphere of how can we support the farmer best? Is insurance the tool here to use? Or could it be that disaster assistance makes more sense in this specific context or social protection or vice versa? Um, also looking at the numbers, as I mentioned, working in partnership with private insurance is a good recipe for success. Even if, there, if there's subsidies involved, it looks like these are the longest lasting projects. 
um, but also investing in essential public services is the step before that. So farmers need to have some kind of awareness. Here we're talking about financial literacy, but also that the market can absorb uh, all these new projects. Um, as I mentioned, subsidizing insurance in various ways is very important. Um, there's a big discussion going on what is a smart subsidy? How can this look like? Um, how can we use this money the best? And I think there's, uh, yeah, we will talk about this more in the Q&A section. And finally, we recommend to organize farmers in meaningful insurance groups, also to diversify risks and um, to get more information going. Right, and this just as a quick overview on what we found. Um, of course, we will be happy to share our study once it's out with this group and overall. And for now, as I wanted to keep this interactive, I would like uh, to uh, put some questions towards Emily and Peter. I would like to start with Emily. Um, as I mentioned, it looks like the, uh, the ideal insurance scheme is between a private insurance and then having some public support. Um, but also often we have, um, we have these, we know this, like how a good scheme should look like, but then we're doing our small project and then another company is doing, uh, or another organization is doing their scheme. So, um, and I just wanted to ask you, what, what do you think? Um, sorry. How can we better promote collaboration in terms of sharing information and learnings across organizations and even possibly sectors? Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. So um, I think you've hit the nail on the head that uh, too often uh, we're very focused just on insurance, um, and that's insurance within our organizations or insurance within a specific project in a country. But um, that's not the way to, to succeed and build insurance markets. So um, I think you've also highlighted in some of your recommendations that agricultural insurance is not a separate sector or a separate approach. So within individual countries, especially when they're um, government supported programs, uh, there's a need for collaboration across also public sector as well as private sector. So for example, um, in the program that I work on Insured, um, we're supporting some agricultural insurance um, education activities in Vietnam together with the government because uh, the government are also subsidizing um, agricultural insurance products and they're also working with the insurers, et cetera. But there's a gap in um, pharma education and awareness and knowledge about agricultural insurance. So what we are doing is um, training provincial level uh, government staff and developing education materials. Um, so these provincial level government staff who have day to day contact with the farmers um, are extension workers or representatives from farmer unions and the department of the cooperatives. Um, and that is one way in which um, you can also involve uh, some other types of actors that are not typically seen as uh, within insurance to um, improve the sustainability and the scale of agricultural insurance schemes as well. And I also want to mention that um, one main aim of the um, insured program that I work on is to integrate agricultural insurance as one part of other um, agricultural development and um, agricultural risk management programs. So um, in this case, we try and integrate it where there is a need amongst EFAD um, loan finance programs. And so in this way, it contributes to other development or risk management objectives, for example, as one part of increasing access to productive finance. Um, so yeah, it's, it's crucial to, to make sure that there is this collaboration in various ways. Yeah, yeah, definitely agree that especially insurance as a sector where we all have to co-work and co-learn. Um, maybe let me pose a question to Peter. Um, as I mentioned, bundling is um, one of our recommendations or one of our success factors that we identified. And it's often seen as a tool to incentivize farmers to buy insurance products, but also adds value to the sold credit, for example. Um, how can we increase bundling with insurance for financial products and what do you think is needed to increase uptake?
This one is it just me or is he frozen? I cannot hear Peter, he's breaking up. Um, can you yes. hear me? I think now it's coming in. Yeah. Maybe if you um, put off your video. Okay, any better? Yeah. All right. Here I live in California, which is supposed to have some of the world's best infrastructure, but it seems that uh, <laughs> the Wi-Fi network <laughs> not quite there yet. Um, no, I was going. To, I was saying um, that farmers show are, are pretty reluctant to buy insurance as a risk as a pure risk management tool. Um, it does need to be linked to something that uh, brings additional value. Um, this has proved to be the most popular form of insurance that has in um, under contract to produce goods, uh, certain commodities, and they were having to buy a whole bundle of, of inputs to go with it. And the contractors um, provided insurance. So if the crop failed, at least the insurance would pay for the, the, the cost of the inputs. The farmer wouldn't have that loss. And it's now a much more general form of insurance. You see it linked to, um, to seed purchases, you fertilize the purchases. Of course, there's a long tradition of linking it to credit. And when you link it to credit, uh, most often you also link it to um, a package of inputs. I mean, what is the credit for? It's to buy seeds, fertilizer or something. So you, you, get, the, you get a whole bundle being put together. Um, it solves a distribution problem for the insurer too, because now you, you, your distribution network is the, the intermediary, the, the seed merchant, the bank or whatever, who's, who's bundling, the, bundling the, their products with the insurance. So it has a lot going for it. Um, and if you look at, well, looking at the survey um, results, some 60% of them were of the programs that were surveyed were, were initiated by the private sector and they nearly all involve bundling. Um, the downside is that they tend to be very small projects, a few hundred or a few, a few thousand farmers. You don't see a lot of this at scale without significant public sector involvement. Uh, so I think it's, it's the most promising approach, um, but let's think that it, I mean, if the insurance is intended to stabilize household income or consumption, particularly for poor people to solve, you know, the food security problem when you have a drought, um, it doesn't do that. All it does is reimburse the cost of, of certain inputs. Uh, it doesn't provide any additional income you know, to offset um, the losses of, of uh, and to stabilize consumption. So it, in a way, it's, it's a very specific and narrow form of insurance, but it is the most successful one that, that's ongoing at present. Sorry, a long answer. <laughs> Not a problem. Um, but I would like to ask you a second one because I can see there's a lot of activity in the chat. So thank you all and please continue if you have any more questions. Um, to you, Peter, as the co-author of our study, there's a very interesting question from Anne-Laure Bihagel. Do you have any insights as to why there is so little agri-insurance offering in West Africa? Talking with the major insurance companies, they say they don't have enough data to price and develop products. Is there anything that can be done to improve this? Now, this is a, a finding, a major finding from the study and, and from other similar studies that wherever you have any sort of scale, um, you've got serious... Public sector is the creation of the building environment, the regulations, the access, the key services, the key role for government, for government, for government. Sorry, Peter, you're breaking up. Ah, well, I, 
don't have any options left, I'm afraid. <laughs> Of my dear, I Sorry, I, I uh, it's probably a connection, but um, yeah, maybe we'll come back to this question later on. Um, yeah, and maybe I can just answer this quick question from Ella Mofad. Um, uh, did you see a difference in the adoption and benefit from the different insurance products for female farmers compared to male farmers? Um, here I have to say that um, I think we all know that data is the commodity when it comes to insurance. So oftentimes it was not very easy for us to get very detailed information and also because insurers are quite private when it comes to their data on their schemes. So we were able in some cases to get gender disaggregated data, but we were not able to get this data um, on a scale reaching all of the schemes. So we couldn't make an analysis cross country or cross regions. Um, so unfortunately, no, we cannot um, have the, we don't have an answer to that question because the data is just too little. Um, and also let me just reply to Patricia. We talked to uh, some insurers and also some reinsurance. And of course, uh, while getting all our data, we had interviews and we had questionnaires for insurers as well. So uh, these 15 plus interviews did not always include just the data interviews. Um, all right, um, then maybe I can put one question to Emily about bundling. It's from Patricia, Patricia as well. So bundling can help build scale, but it may solve the distributors or aggregators problem. How much of farmers' needs are accounted for in these bundled products? Yeah, so um, for uh, agricultural insurance to be successful, it needs to meet the needs of everybody. Um, so you're absolutely right that actually often people when designing schemes forget about the interests of the distribution channels um, and their incentives of, as well. But um, of course, the, the, the key is the farmer's needs. So I can think of a couple of examples. So um, one scheme that uh, we support in Zambia is um, uh, agricultural insurance or crop insurance linked to um, credit for solar home systems. And this is a benefit for the insurer because it helps them to scale uh, their market. It is a benefit for the distribution channels, in this case, the solar pago companies, because um, they saw a drop in uh, payments or repayments um, when there was a drought uh, in rural areas. But it is also a benefit for the farmers um, because it enables them to continue to have access to the solar home systems um, when typically they would have um, issues in paying when there's a drought. So, um, and there are other examples we're looking into in Cambodia, um, for example, looking into the vegetable value chain um, to see if insurance could help farmers um, having access to um, productive assets um, where, whereas typically they cannot access the financing for these, um, can insurance help them to access the finance? So the farmer's needs should always come first, but it's about um, s serving the interests of everybody, including the distribution channels as well. Totally agreed. Also makes for a longer lasting product if everyone can win, sure. Um, then the next question is from Davide Castellani. Um, have you considered comparing micro, meso and macro level programs and how they perform differently? Um, yes, we have. Um, and you can find the results in our study that we have a more detailed overview of the numbers. We also did some sub sample analysis. So for example, we divided by public and private and we divided by also the levels so of micro, meso, macro and the regions. So, um, to keep it interesting, I would say have a look at the study when it comes out in about a month. Um, right, then um, I think I caught most of the question. What was the take up rate? Question from France. Do you have any rough estimation? Um, I'm not sure if that's referring to our study or like a general question from one of the answers. Maybe France, you can uh, come in and tell us what you are referring to. I'm 
Okay, insurance products that were mentioned in one of the answers or mentioned in one of, uh, or in general, the ones mentioned in the study. I think he may talk about the coverage rates. Yeah, okay. Alexander, I think that's you, <laughs> iPad 3. <laughs> Uh, so Alexander is also a colleague uh, working on the study. So do you want to take this question? Yes, maybe I can even show myself. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexander. I'm just talking from a hotel room. I'm sorry. Um, so um, I think we, we, we can, we, we saw some of the coverage rates. Um, it largely depends uh, on, on the individual countries and schemes that we were looking at. In, um, in China and India, they are extremely high. So the uptake rates are, are quite, quite high, up to 80%. Um, and in other countries, so if you take India and China away, it really drops down to, to 10% on the global level. And then for certain regions, it goes even below, like especially for Sub-Saharan Africa. Am I correct, Rebecca? Yes, sounds about right. Um, and then the final questions I see in the chat. Uh, can you share your experience about insurance companies' trust and loyalty up to their customers, like low-income farmers, especially non-indicator-based insurance? Um, Emily, do you have any experience with that in your work? Um, it's an interesting take because uh, normally we speak about uh, farmers' trust of the insurance companies, which is a very big issue. And um, for insurance companies, they tend to not always be very interested in this market because they don't um, uh, see the opportunities or have a business models to reach uh, the hardest to reach people um, efficiently, and especially for uh, non-index based uh, products. Um, what I could say is that um, as, as sometimes, uh, a result of uh, subsidized schemes is that, um, uh, especially where they're state insurers, the state insurers might be obliged to offer certain uh, products, but they won't necessarily design um, the insurance term sheets in a favorable way for, for the producers. So technically they can say that they are offering the products that are offered by the government, but then in reality, um, they will uh, look to reduce um, their risk as much as possible as a company. So these are some of the uh, effects that happen, whereas um, they could change their term sheets and, and the contracts with the farmers to make sure that the farmers get um, a better payout or better compensation in the event of a, a risk um, occurring. So, um, so that's sort of one, one example. It, 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 it's not necessarily linked to trust, um, but linked to um, yeah, some, of the, some of the challenges and the ways that insurers might not best serve uh, the clients. Yeah, true, thanks. Um, okay, and then uh, I missed the question from Hans. What is the difference between insurance coverage with some subsidy element and social protection of smallholder farmers? Alexander, do you wanna answer this? Yeah, very happy to take uh, on the question of, of Hans. Um, well, from our perspective, social protection is one of the different objectives that uh, agriculture insurance can, um, can address. Social protection would be kind of a government goal um, comparable to, for example, disaster risk management or um, support of uh, food production or a stabilization of individual uh, in the industry sectors, such as agriculture. So we have those different kind of government objectives, roles that need to be fulfilled. And then agriculture insurance is one financial tool that can serve different kind of objectives. And that's what we what we kind of see is in, in quite, quite a number of the programs that where we originally thought this is actually about securing uh, individual farms. So kind of a proper private um, financial product. It seems that it very often kind of crosses over to social protection in a way that the subsidies are so high 
uh, and the target group is so specifically uh, you know, tailored to or, or aimed at the lower end of the pyramid that it really becomes some form of social protection. So there seems to be kind of a, a, uh, a kind of a, a crossing of the different objectives. And that's where we asked ourselves, especially in, in, the, in, the, in the study, then how, how do you align the different objectives of disaster risk management, social protection, and stabilization of, of food production? So there are different objectives, and, and we still struggle a little bit with, um, is for what is agriculture insurance the best tool? So is it really the best tool to serve? Uh, and, and that's what we have the feeling like in, in India, for example, in China, does, is it the best tool to serve social protection? And um, so that's for us the relationship between agriculture insurance and social protection and the questions that, that steam from that. Right, thank you. Um, also, um, a quick question to everyone. I see we're nearing the end of the session, but there's still a lot of questions coming in and I would hate to stop the discussion. Also, we might have time at the end for a quick exercise. So I would just uh, keep this running and uh, we'll be happy for everyone to stay on. But of course, if you have to leave, thank you for taking the time. Um, and I can see, Peter, you're back. How is the sound situation on your side? Um, sounds good at my end. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's leave. a lot better now. That's great. Okay. Um, then maybe I can post the next question directly to you. So farmer awareness and understanding continues to be a challenge. Based on the study, who is bearing the costs for making the farmers understand insurance and related benefits? Is it the insurer or distributor or the government? Um, it would be nice if the private insurers would educate farmers, but they, um, they will not they will not really do that to an adequate level because say if company A goes out and trains all the farmers and then they demand insurance, uh, then company B can come in and, 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 and capture some of the benefits of that investment. So this is really a public goods problem. You need a, a public uh, service here. Um, the extension service um, may be the appropriate tool if, uh, if you have ag agricultural extension agents trained in insurance. Um, intermediaries like seed companies, financial institutions, they can all play key roles here. But, but there has to be something more than just private sector investment if this is really going to, to reach the kind of scale that we need for insurance to take off. Also comes back into play into our recommendations, like we need this underlying foundation. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, and then maybe the next question also right back to you. What do you think is the motivation for private reinsurers to enter into this market that seems to be high risk and low profit? So that's for me? Yes. Ah. Um. My, we, we interviewed a number of the big international uh, reinsurers as part of this survey, and uh, I was very impressed how on the ball they are. I mean, organizations like Swiss Re, they, they have their own research department. Uh, they know what's going on in the insur ag insurance uh, business all around the world. They have, part they have partnerships with national insurers and so on. Um, these guys don't need anyone to tell them how to do their job. <laughs> What's holding them back, according to the interviews, is you know, the, a, partly the, the insufficient government support in, in many countries. And I didn't finish the question on West Africa, but that's one of the problems, the enabling environment, the key public services that have to be provided by government. That's missing in many countries, and that really holds back the, the, the big insurers. Um, also, unpredictable government policies. I mean, governments may decide to subsidize insurance, and, and that really can expand the, the, the opportunities for the private sector. But then suddenly the government has a budget crisis, so they cancel the subsidy or they slash it, and then the insurers are left high and dry. <laughs> so they, they need stability in government policy towards what, uh, insurance programs. Um, but no, they're ready to go. I, I think the real constraint is not the private insurers and the reinsurers. It, it's a lack of public support and, and the key messages have to get 
be you know it's it's reaching the the governments reaching the donor community convincing them that they really have to to do more in in some countries if if insurance is going to take off maybe can i can i add to to this response if that's okay rebecca um so also just to say that actually uh, for the reinsurers um they it's not too high risk for them and if um if the product design and the underlying data they see it as uh, not robust enough then they will add something called um uh, an uncertainty loading so um an uncertainty of the of the data of the cost of the risk to the premium so that is what you do not want because then it translates as a higher cost for whoever's then paying the uh, the eventual premium, be it a farmer or a distribution channel or a government. So it's important to make sure that there are good product designs and underlying data so they do not price for this uh, high risk. And then they, of course, have bigger portfolios where they can they can spread their risk. Um, yeah, so that's that's one one thing that um, that I wanted to add, and also that you really need to have reinsurance, especially for index insurance, where typically we're looking at insuring um, covariate or very very widespread risks that happen for a lot of people in one place at the same time. So that's why reinsurers are really important in the conversation of agricultural insurance. Definitely, uh, thanks for coming in. Um, and then the final question I see in the chat, where can we find the study? So the study is not out yet, um, but it will be out in a couple of uh, days or weeks. And then we will be happy to send out um, the information on all the channels that we can get our hands on that uh, this document is out. So um, keep your eyes open for uh, the study. It's called um, the current state of agricultural insurance an update. And it's from GIZ and co-authored with Peter Hazel. And just now I see another question coming in. Given the lack of transparency in the sector, how can one support data collection and analysis for product development? Um, I think this is more geared towards Emily. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question and it's a very difficult uh, one to answer and there's still ongoing um, activities. So, um, you know, in theory, this should also be like a, a public good. That would be a nice, um, a nice place to get to, where uh, governments um, collect yield data, weather data, and uh, satellite data, um, and remotely sensed uh, modeling, and have it all um, in one place in order to be suitable for insurance, which has very specific data requirements about the level of collection, the timeliness of the reporting, et cetera, as well as uh, supporting other, um, other purposes beyond insurance if you're going to make such an investment in data. Now, in reality, there's, there's a long way to go to, to get to that where um, there is this sort of ownership of the data in the countries, although of course some uh, meteorological departments have some good um, networks and some insurers are able to access um, those when they're just using weather data. Um, so public support I think is key. Then in private schemes, um, or schemes that have some involvement of uh, technical service providers that are private, um, they also have their own sort of data collection and product design um, methods. So we work with, there are a lot of technical service providers or insure tech um, companies that sit behind the scenes and support some of the processes and the product designs for insurers. Um, and so they also, collect a data um, and they have their own yield collection protocols um, or there are a lot of remote sensing service providers that um, collect and process the satellite data together with other ground data and come up with the indexes. So um, private or public schemes are already working with different solutions to collect this data, but I agree that there should, in an ideal world, be a push where it's more country owned and um, ground data and remote sensing data and weather data all together. Yeah, thank you. Um, and 
of course, I would like to add um, in regards to how can you get the study. If you are interested, when it comes out, you can put your email in the chat and then we can kind of create like a newsletter once it's out and send you the study. And of course, this would be a once off and you wouldn't get any news or updates or information from GIZ in general. All right, um, I see no further questions. And as we are a little bit over time already, I think um, I would close the chat for now. So thank you everyone for participating. These questions were great, really interesting discussions. Um, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Peter, for joining us. It was a pleasure talking to you again once more. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in the study, put your email in the chat. We'll send it out as soon as it's published. And then thanks once more um, to everyone and have a great evening.